Right now, grab your Bibles. Uh, with, you probably noticed when you came in, the communion table is set in the back, and uh, we'll partake communion together. And we are in the second part of a message that we started last week, what is right and what is wrong. If you need a Bible, the ushers would love to give you one. Just raise your hand. Um, what is right and what is wrong? Uh, we live in a world where, boy, right and wrong is really confusing, right? Like we, we, we talked about it at length last week. Won't go into it uh, now. But if you missed last week's message, I would encourage you, go online or we have a podcast. Either way, go to our website or to the podcast and uh, catch up. I think it's a, a super important message for our day. What is right and what is wrong and who decides? Well, we looked last week that God decides who, what is right and wrong. We looked in Scripture, and just as a review, we saw there is one truth, and there is one truth giver. We looked at that passage from the book of James. There is one law and one law giver who is able to save and to destroy, and we ought to fear him. And so God decides what's right and wrong. There is right and wrong. There is absolute truth. Truth is not relative. Truth is empirical. It can be measured. And there is right and wrong. And God's truth is established in His Word. And we saw last week that in Genesis, in the very beginning, the one prohibition that God gave mankind was do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that loses something from Hebrew to English, but the, 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 the paraphrase that would really help us understand what God was telling us was do not decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. God has decided what is good and God has decided what is evil, and that is not open for a debate. Do not partake of that tree. And so the one pro prohibition that God gave us was don't decide for yourself what is good, what is evil. Follow me. Follow me. I give you laws. I give you commandments. I give you instruction. Why? So that you might have a prosperous and fruitful life. Abounding with joy. Led by His powerful Word that is able to bring wisdom and discernment into our lives. And so the instruction God gave from the beginning of time was don't decide, do not partake in the knowledge of what is good and evil. That's my job, walk in my ways. Why? Why? Here's why, because we're not qualified to partake. There's a lot of things that sound good to us on the surface. Well, hey, we love each other. As long as we love each other, why can't we? Well, that seems right. But when we walk in God's ways, we find out it brings fruit that is abounding. And when we disobey God's ways, we find that the consequences are far higher, far greater than we ever dreamed. Isn't it amazing where selfishness will take you? Isn't it amazing how pride will blind you to your own folly? Isn't it amazing how sin will take you down a rabbit hole so much deeper than you ever wanted to go that will cost you so much more than you ever wanted to spend? And God trying to protect us. Which parent of young children tells the children, go run amok in the street. Go play on the freeway. No, no, no. Just the opposite. A loving parent puts boundaries a little picket fence in the yard so the kids can't go get ran over in the street. Why? Because they're not able to discern. And so we've been made in the image of God, created in His very image. But that does not mean God is like us. For God said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my understanding far above yours. Therefore, let me guide you in life with what is right and what is wrong. And how we need that in a society today where we can't even decide how many bathrooms our restaurant needs to have. 
It's a crazy thing, but we see the importance of following God's standard. It brings joy and life and abundance to our existence. And as a good father instructing his kids, God has given us good instruction of what is right and wrong. So this is where we were left off last week, Genesis chapter 2. We'll pick it up this week in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, God has put this prohibition there. He's given them this perfect environment where they can exercise a relationship with God, a free will relationship. Do you want to walk with me? Eat of every tree that in, the, in the world that I've created. All of it is yours. There's trees that are pleasant to the sight, good for shade, just really a beauty to look at. There's other trees that are good for food. You can partake of all of them. Build a tree house, pull an orange, have an avocado. Do it. Someone just brought me a glass of homemade squeezed orange juice 15 minutes ago, and I'm like, yes, I can't wait till service is over and go drink that. Uh, enjoy all that God has for you. We planted avocado trees in our backyard, two of them, and I thought, are these things ever going to bear fruit? It's been like, like six or seven years. Finally, we got our first avocado, and we made tacos with guacamole. It was amazing, amazing. And God says, yeah, enjoy everything, but as a token of our relationship, to show that you trust me, I'm going to give you the ability to walk in my ways or not. And isn't it interesting that today we still have the opportunity to partake of that tree of knowledge and good and evil? Yeah, well, I know God says that, but I think this is good. I'm going to do it. I think this is ancient stuff. I mean, what does that have to do with me? That was written thousands of years ago. I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to do this. Guess what you're doing? You are partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's dangerous. It won't bring the joy and satisfaction that the deception that sin promises will never be there. It'll leave you empty and bankrupt. And we're going to see that's exactly what happens to Adam and Eve. Uh, chapter 3, uh, we read the first couple of verses of 3. We're going to pick up where we left off. We'll start in verse 1. Now, the serpent was more cunning. Everybody say more cunning. You know what it means? It means more deceptive. It means more shrewd. It means he's smarter than you. It means he's no match for you. It means he can deceive you easily. He can get you to... Get your eyes on the wrong things with no problem. He's more cunning than any creature God ever made. This is in his fallen state. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan always trying to make it look like God is holding back on you. Oh, man, God's really holding back on you. Did God tell you you can't eat every tree of the garden? And she says, oh, we can eat the tree of the gardens. Big mistake, by the way. The moment you're dialoguing with Satan, don't ever dialogue with Satan. Don't go around rebuking Satan. Don't go around arguing with Satan. Do what the book of Jude tells us to do. Even Michael the archangel didn't bring reviling accusation against him. He simply said, Lord, will you take care of this? Lord, I come to you. Lord, I pray to you. Lord, will you rebuke him? Lord, I'm calling on your name, not his name. She's already in the wrong spot when she's dialoguing with Satan. And the woman said to the serpent, verse 2, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, you shall not touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, say, you will not surely die. It's no big deal. This isn't that big a deal. No problem. It's all okay. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, deciding what is good and what is evil. We looked last week, was that a truth or was that a lie? It was a truth, wasn't it? I'm not going to go into it in depth now, but if you want to know more about that, go back and listen to last week. This wasn't a lie. This was a deception. When they partake of this, they will start deciding what is good and evil, just like God does. And we have no business doing that. 
The reason Satan wanted us to do that, wanted them to do that, is because he knows they're not qualified to do so. And the moment that they do, they're putty in his hands. Verse 6. This is where we left off. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Yeah, it appealed to the lust of her flesh. Ooh, I kind of like this. It looks good. Isn't it interesting how we're drawn to the forbidden? Just, it's interesting. And she's drawn to it. Good for food. She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. It appealed to the lust of her eyes. And what's happening here? Satan is causing Eve to doubt the veracity of God's Word. The power of God's Word. The application of God's Word in her life. He's causing her to doubt if God's Word is right or or not. She wants to decide for herself what is right and wrong. She saw it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was desirable to make one wise. Interesting. The pride of life. The enemy will always appeal to our pride. It is our Achilles heel. Hey, they disrespected you. They did? Man, I'll show them. They said this about you. They did? Oh my gosh, I got it. Always appealing to our pride. Hey, you got to go in that meeting. You better make yourself look good. Make sure they know how much you know about the Bible when you go to your Bible study. Appealing to the pride of life. And she was hook, line, and sinker. Suddenly, the lust of the flesh was calling her name. The lust of the eye was calling her name. And above all else, the pride of life was saying, hey, you could really be something if you do this. And so she took its fruit, and she ate. And she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to circle the word naked, double underline it. And we're going to come back and talk about this more. But before we do, I do want to say one simple thing. It does not mean she finally realized she didn't have any clothes on. Okay? That's not what we're talking about. I guarantee you, when God brought Eve to Adam, and he said, be fruitful and multiplied, they got fruitful right away. So this isn't a realization of, wow, I never knew this before. I guess I was stupid. Now I know I don't have clothes on. No, 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 no. So we'll look at what that means in just a minute. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves covering. This is the fall of man. The fall of man. The fall of man, yeah, the moment that man turns from an intimate relationship with God and says, I'll do my own thing. The fall of man. And what a tragic fall it is. Adam and Eve both sin. They both disobey God. And when we talk about sin, we we don't really grasp what sin really is. Sin is simply missing the mark. God had a perfect setup for them, a way where they could have an amazing, abundant life. And he said, here, I've created all this for you. The whole earth is yours. You, can, you have dominion over it. You are the king and queen of earth. Rule over all the animals. Rule over all the fruits and the vegetables and the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. You are the consummate of my creation. I made all of the earth for you. I want you to enjoy it. And I made you for me. You are valuable. You are special. You are unique in all of the creation I made. Only in you did I breathe my spirit. You were created to be in relationship with me. And in this utopia environment where everything was right, they missed the mark and they stepped outside of what was good for them. Sin, we look at it and we go, oh man, yeah, I'm not supposed to do that, but I really want to. (sighs) 
I'll probably regret doing that later. <laughs> and we look at it as attractive and fun. I want you to know something. That's the deception of sin. Sin simply means missing God's best for your life. Missing all the great plans God has for you. How many of you have high schoolers? Keep your hands up. We need to pray for these people right here. Yeah, as a parent of a high schooler, here's what I know you're doing. You're thinking about their college, and you're saving money, and you're preparing, and you're hoping, and you're trying to talk them into get, getting good grades. Why? Because you have a plan for their life. Ways to make them be successful, where they can grow, where they can experience all the rewards of being a productive human who serves others and who has the disciplines to get through hard studies to accomplish great things. And you set that up for them. And that teenager goes, wow, girls, wow, guys, wow, marijuana, wow, beer. And they go, I want to try this stuff. And what happens? A parent's heart breaks because what's happening? That's missing the mark of what you're setting up for them. Hey, that's going to take you on the wrong path. That's going to make these are mutually exclusive. You can't do this and do this. you got to decide. Sin is missing the mark. And Adam and Eve here, they miss the mark of all that God has planned for them. And how tragic the fall. How tragic. Guys, I want to talk to you for a moment individually. Men. Because I find Adam's sin even more appalling, even more offensive than Eve's. Why? Because guys, like it or not, want it or not, God has called you to be the spiritual leader of your family. God commanded Adam to be the spiritual leader of his family. God spoke to Adam and said, Adam, I don't want you to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That would have meant that Adam was to lead. And Adam abdicated his responsibility. We are to be the spiritual authorities in our homes. What does that mean? Well, it means that it is a man's responsibility to make sure that God is being honored in our homes, in our lives, in our hearts, and in our families. It's a man's responsibility. That cannot happen apart from understanding and knowing God's Word. Any more than I could be an electrician without understanding electricity. No, you got to kind of start with the basics. This is electricity. It can kill you. It can bless you. you got to learn how it works. Well, in the same way, to be a spiritual leader, we have to be leading our families in the Word of God, both with our actions, with our behaviors, with our heart, and in actual teaching. And God gave this to Adam to, Adam to, to do that. God put Adam on point to be a spiritual leader. And you know what Adam did? Adam did what many men did. Excuse me. Adam did what many men do. He left his post as a spiritual leader. He left his post. He left his post. Adam, you were called to something here. What are you doing? He abdicated his God-given responsibility. I want you to know something. Eve was deceived. Do you know what the Bible tells us? This might surprise some of you. You know what the Bible tells us? Adam wasn't deceived. Adam willfully did this. Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. Look what second, excuse me, 1 Timothy 2.14 says. Read it with me out loud. Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. What's that? Yeah, Adam willfully knew what was going on. Eve was deceived by the lust of the flesh, by the pride of life, by the lust of the eye. She was just deceived. Adam abdicated his role. Why? 
Adam should have said, Eve, what are you doing by that tree? Step away from the tree, <laughs> right? What are you doing talking to the serpent? Come on, baby, let's go to the beach. He should have done anything, right? Get her out of there. But instead, what do we read? Somehow Adam is right there hanging out with her by, at, the, at, the, at the prohibition. Why? Why? And you know what I think? You know, how many times do you think they were hanging out at this prohibition? I doubt it was the first time. If I know anything about God at all, here's what I know about God. God is faithful. And the first time they hung out there, God said, no, I'm not going to let it ruin their future forever. I don't know how many times. That's somewhat speculation, but take with it what you wish. But this time, here, there they are. They're hanging out again, and Adam's there with her. He's hanging out. Why was he there? Adam, what are you doing there? Why did Adam go along with the sin? Why didn't he stop it? Well, perhaps, perhaps he was too weak to tell her, no, we're not doing this. Perhaps he was too weak and didn't want to deal with the hassle. He just wanted to take the easy road. Perhaps. Perhaps maybe he himself had a real interest in that forbidden fruit. And he was thinking, well, if she does it, it's not me doing it. So he followed her instead of leading her. And men, I want to talk to you for a moment. Are you playing that game? Pretty quiet. Are you playing that game with entertainment? Well, baby, if you want to watch that movie, I mean, okay. Are you playing that game? Well, you, you know, you, baby, you, you, want, you want a drink? Okay, if you want to. I mean, I guess we could. Are you playing that game? Oh, baby, you want, you want to go to lunch instead of going to church? Are you sure? Is that what you want to do? Well, okay. With your debt? Are you living beyond your means because, well, baby, if you want that house, are you sure? I don't know if we can afford it. Hey. Do not abdicate your role as spiritual leader. Don't allow yourself to get in bondage to debt and then say, well, why did you buy that? Well, my wife wanted it. No, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why did Adam go along with it? Maybe because he had interest in that tree and he thought, well, it won't be mine. And I'll just stand before God and I'll say, hey, she did it. And, and God, God's going to say, hey, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. Guys, we have a responsibility to lead our families well. And I tell you, what this nation needs is good, strong male leadership who has a heart for God, men who have their eyes on Jesus, men who love God's word, men who are willing to do the hard things, men who are really to, willing to stand in the gap and lead their families so their teenage daughters don't go out the door with shorts that look like you know what and a top that looks like you know what. Guys that say, hey baby, I'm sorry, get your butt back in the house and put some clothes on, you're not going out that way. Amen? And maybe you need to say that to your wife. Hey, God is not against sex. God created sex, but it's in his context, and we're not to take it out of the boundaries of what he's established. I tell you, have you looked at magazine covers in the grocery store? We're out of control. And it's time for God's men to bring things back into God's standards, and I need to get off that because I could preach a whole sermon on that. I will say this, I want to talk to the young Christian men for a moment, just the young guys. I am disappointed when I see a young Christian man dating a young Christian girl, and he's allowing the young Christian girl to decide how far they will go sexually. Seriously? You know what I love seeing? I love seeing a young Christian man who has his eyes on Jesus, who puts the Lord above his own desires and says, 
from very early in the relationship, first date, second date, very third date, very early in the relationship, these are the boundaries. This is the God I worship. He is the one who is leading my path. He is taking me on a bright future, and I am not departing from his ways. Oh, I love seeing that. I love seeing that. And gals, I want you to know, if he does not lead well in your dating relationship, guess what? He won't be a good spiritual leader in the marriage. If he is not a good spiritual leader denying his flesh to obey God, putting you above his own desires in the dating relationship, do you think that's going to happen magically when, you, when I marry you and you think God's going to sprinkle fairy dust on you on the altar and now he's going to be a different guy? No, the guy that you walk down the aisle with is the same guy that walks out this way. There's no fairy dust at the altar. That is fake religion. And I know there's a lot of churches who will give you that fake religion, you know. Come have some supernatural experience and you'll be different forever. That's not who God is. God says, walk with me. It's quiet in here. Am I preaching too loud? (laughs) Walk with me. Let's do life together. Take on my ways and learn of me. I've got amazing things planned for you. It's going to be incredible. This is the world I built for you. Enjoy it. Now be careful. There's some dangers out there. Does that make sense? Men, be men. Be men. Hold your post as a spiritual leader. Lead by example. Here's what I want you to know. A man who holds his post as a spiritual leader, he honors God. And you know what happens when a man honors God, when a man walks with God, when a man reveres God? You know what happens? God gives him the keys to the kingdom. And he endows him with wisdom, with discernment, with joy overflowing with an amazing sex life, with prosperity at work, with the the character that, that his boss and his peers go, wow, he stands out above all the rest. We want to promote him. This is God's man. This is what God does. Oh, walk in his ways. They are abounding. They are amazing. And they are worthy of all of our heart's obedience. Men be men for crying out loud and hold our post as spiritual leaders. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. And I want you to know, hey, you don't have to be perfect. I'm not saying, you, you know, hey, I'm not perfect. I'm not, but here's what, here's what, all you have to be is committed to Jesus. And when you mess up, which I do often, just get right back on track. Lord, I messed up. Will you please wash me in my sin? Help me get right back on track. It's not any more complex than that. You don't have a heavenly father who can't sympathize with our weakness or understand, but he was tempted in all points as we are and yet without sin. And we have a high priest that we can go to who understands our weaknesses and will be able to bring comfort and help in a time of need. It's the book of Hebrews, right? So that's what we have. And men, may we hold our spot. Adam abdicated his role as spiritual leader, and the results were catastrophic. Verse 7 says that Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. I asked you to circle that word. What does it mean, they knew they were naked? What does that mean? If it doesn't mean they don't have any clothes on, and that's not what it means, what does it mean? Here's what it means. You ready? It means they died spiritually. Adam and Eve died spiritually. The moment that they disobeyed God, they died spiritually. You say, well, how so? What does that mean? Well, here's what, what, here's what we understand. Here's what we glean. Adam and Eve were walking and talking with God in the cool of the day. They were clothed with the very presence of God. In other words, they had the Holy Spirit dwelling in them and upon them in ways that you and I can only dream about. Scripture tells us that we have the earnest or the deposit or the down payment of the Holy Spirit because of Jesus' redemptive acts on the cross. That those of us who are in Christ, we have the earnest or the down payment of the Holy Spirit that seals us to the day of redemption. But it's only the earnest or the down payment. Adam and Eve had the fullness, the fullness of the Holy Spirit upon their life. 
They did not have a sin nature. They were holy. You and I have a sin nature. The Bible says that sin brings separation from God. That's what happened. And the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, they were clothed with the glory of God. And the moment they disobeyed God, here's what happened. Woof! The presence of God departed from them, and what they were once clothed with, the righteousness and the glory of God, departed from them, and they were naked. We need to understand some things about God. The Bible says that God dwells in light. God dwells in light. And there's a ton of verses that I could take you to that would really amplify this, and it's worthy of a study on your own. But let me show you a couple real quick. Psalm 104 on your screens. Let me hear you read this out loud. Read it with me, church. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as with a garment. The Bible talks about the Shekinah glory of God, this radiant glory that would come out of the temple. It was just the manifestation of God's presence. We know the, the, that Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church, killing Christians, and Jesus came to him as he was riding into Damascus. And do you remember what happened? Paul said, I saw him, and he was brighter than the noonday's sun. And his brightness was so bright that it knocked me to the ground and I fell on my face. The brightness was so bright that he, he was blinded. The Bible says no man can see God and live because we're separated from, by sin. And he is so bright that we, we can't even stand in his presence. The Bible says that the new Jerusalem will have no need for the sun because we'll be in the presence of, of, of God. And the presence of God will illuminate and light the entire city. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. He's, he's the amazing one. Do you remember when Moses was taking the children of Israel through the wilderness and he said, Lord, I want to see more of you. In Exodus 33, I want to see you, Lord. And God said, Moses, no man can see me and live. Moses, you've got a sin nature. If you come into my presence, you'll be consumed. That which is sinful cannot come into the presence of that which is holy. That's what the word holy means, separate. Jesus said, our Father that art in heaven, close, personal, intimate relationship." Holy be your name, as far away from what I am as you could ever imagine. Only in Christianity is God both a close, personal, intimate Father, and also so far away, so righteous that we can't even approach Him. He's both. Moses says, God, I want to see you. Moses, isn't it enough that you're talking with God, that He's speaking to you, that you got, you're leading God's people, that you get to Go up on the mountain. Isn't it? Moses says, no, I'm hungry for more. God, I want to see you. And God says, well, Moses, you can't see me. But I am the rewarder of those who diligently seek me, and you are really desiring me, man. So I'll tell you what I'll do. Come up to the mountain. I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. The cleft of a rock, the rock, a picture of Jesus Christ. The cleft, beaten by storms, beaten by, that creates a cleft, a picture of the cross. I will hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I will pass by. And after I pass by, you can come out of the cleft of the rock, and you will see my glory after I've left. Moses does that. Do you remember? God passes by. Moses comes and waits. He hides in the cleft of the rock. He can't look. After God passes by, Moses comes out, and he's just in worship, just falls in worship. And something happened. Moses spends his days up there with the Lord. Weeks go by. Later he comes down from the mountain. And the Bible tells us something very interesting about Moses. What does it tell us? He was radiating the glory of God. His face was glowing. So much so that the people said, Moses, we can't look at you. Put a veil on. It's too intimidating. It's too awesome. And Moses put a veil on, and the glory faded over time for Moses, not being in the presence of God. Question for you. 
Was Moses a sinner? Absolutely, just like all of us. And yet Moses, even though he was a sinner, just he couldn't be in God's presence, but just being in God's presence after it passed, came down from the mountain, glowing the radiation, just radiating the glory of God. What do you think Adam and Eve looked like when they were not sinners, when they were righteous, and they walked and talked with God in the cool of the day? What do you think they looked like? Wow. Clothed with the very glory and presence of God. And Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and the cost was far higher. The price was far greater. The moment they disobeyed, guess what happened to that Shekinah glory that they were clothed in? (sighs) And there they were, desperately naked. Once clothed with the glory of God, now struggling with guilt and shame. Can I take a rabbit trail for you real quick? I have good news for you. If you are in Jesus Christ, if he is your Lord and Savior, if you walk with him in spirit and truth, I have good news for you. This glory that Adam and Eve once had, this glory, this presence of God, this spirit being upon them in its fullness that they lost, will be restored again. At the resurrection, our bodies will be once again clothed with the glory of God. Just incredible. And when I pass on, whenever that may be, man, do not weep for me. Love my wife, love my kids, please. But man, I cannot wait for that day. I meditate on it often. I can't wait to stand in his presence. I can't be wait. I can't wait to take this corrupt, filthy body and have it be clothed with the righteousness of God. Here's what Daniel says about it. Daniel chapter 12. Read this with me. Speaking of the resurrection, speaking of those who walk with God, speaking of those who have faith in his righteousness and not their own, here's what Daniel says. Read with me. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteous like the stars forever and ever. Isn't that awesome? Our resurrected bodies are going to be clothed with the very spirit of God. The Shekinah glory of God. 2 Corinthians is another great, great verse. Chapter 5, it talks about this on the screens. For we know that if our earthly house, he's talking about our physical bodies, this tent. Yeah, this isn't my home. I am a spirit. I am living in a body. This body is just a tent. It's a temporary dwelling place. We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house made with the heavens. Excuse me, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And read this with me. For this we groan, earnestly desiring to what? To be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. And if indeed having been clothed, we will not be found what? Naked, taking us back to Genesis in the fall. A lot of verses on this subject. Uh, Here's another one. This corruption must put on incorruption. This mortality must put on immortality. And then the the glory of God will be radiating, will be walking, will be actually in the presence of God, will actually be... You know, you hear people say, well, how's it going to work when you go to heaven? Is there going to be like a long line to get up to see God? Nope, he'll be dwelling with you. He'll be upon you. He's omnipresent. God is a spirit. Those that worship him must worship him as spirit. These are things that are beyond our comprehension, but you will always be in the fullness of God's presence. Someone say hallelujah. I can't wait. Uh, i got to get back to my notes somewhere. Um... So this nakedness that Adam and Eve experienced was quite a severe loss. And when we decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong, it is always quite a severe loss. It always costs us more than we ever would have dreamed. Because of sin, Adam and Eve are now spiritually dead. And this is a morbid thought, but I have to tell you the truth. All of Adam and Eve's descendants 
are born spiritually dead. Yeah, three-year-old little Johnny is not a little angel. He's got a sin nature that looks just like Adam and Eve's fall. And we need to realize that, hey, we, we are spiritually dead. We're spiritually dead. This is why Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't understand that in John chapter 3 when Jesus said, what do you mean he's got to be born again? Does he have to enter back into the mother's womb and be born again? What are you talking about born again? Jesus said, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't understand these things? I'm not talking about a physical birth. There's a water birth, a vaginal birth, and there's a spiritual birth. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. You must be born again. And he goes on, he says, hey, the wind blows where it wants. You can't tell where it came from. You can't tell where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's a spiritual work. It's a work of God. God calls us to himself. He says, hey, you need to repent of your sins. You need to make me the Lord of your life. You say, how do I get born again? It's really simple. Just be honest with Jesus about your sin. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin. You want to be a Christian today? You can be a Christian. Here's your altar call. Be honest with God about your sin. And say, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. And now I make you Lord of my life. No longer do I decide what's right and wrong. You decide what's right and wrong. I'll walk in your path. And every time I mess up, I'll come to you and say, Lord, will you please cleanse me? And I'll get right back on track with you because you're the Lord of my life. It's not any more complex than that. And today, if you make that decision, welcome to the family of God. You're a Christian. No, no, no. Can I please have a, some kind of supernatural experience? Can someone hit me on the head and make me fall over backwards? I'd like to experience something. Well, then you're making up your own God one more time. That's not who he is. He's not lightning bolt God. He's relationship God. Walk with him. Walk with him. In this life, Jesus calls the spiritually dead to come to him, and he gives them spiritual life. That's what it means to be born again. We come to him, we make him Lord, and we receive life. We understand his love. Our eyes are opened. We begin to perceive and hear and experience him in ways never before. Jesus said it very simply. He said, blessed are the pure in heart. You'll see God. You'll see God in creation. You'll see God in the birth of your child. You'll see God when you sin, and you'll feel his spirit convicting you of sin and leading you to the truth. You'll see him when you go out uh, and to be filled with compassion for a poor man who needs help, and you've got to, you'll see him working all over the place if you're just honest, if you're just pure in heart. But notice what happens. Verse 7. Adam and Eve, what do they try to do? Instead of just being pure in heart, notice what they do. This is what it means. This is what happens when you're spiritually dead. This is what you do when you're spiritually dead. What do they do? They try to cover their nakedness by sewing fig leaves together. Crazy. They try to cover their nakedness by the works of their hands. You go to the self-realization fellowship, you go to any religion, you go to Islam, you go to yoga, you go to whatever you want to go to, and they will have one common theme, cover your imperfections by trying harder and getting better. You are trying to cover your spiritual nakedness by the works of your hands, and it's insanity. It's insanity. It doesn't work. They try to cover their nakedness and their shame by sewing fig leaves together. You know what this tells me? You know what this reveals to me? You know how much this lines up with life that I see every single day? People have an incredible need to be justified. People have an insatiable need to be justified. People have a desperate need to be justified. You go and you watch a married couple argue, and you know what you will see? You will see two people trying to do what? justify their behaviors. Well, no, I, 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 I know I said that, but I didn't mean that. I said that because you said this. 
Well, I know I said that, but you did this. and then, Well, I know, but don't look at that. It's you did this. Why? Because we have a desperate need to be what? Justified. Justified. Adam and Eve, what are you doing making fig leaves? Oh, I have a desperate need to be justified. It is so incredible, so amazing, this need that we have, that we even do it over the smallest of things. I'm driving in the car with my family. Windows are up. Suddenly, stinks in here. Hey, did you? No, no, no. Okay, wait a minute. There's only four of us in the car. Someone, right? Why? Because we want to be justified. We don't want to be the one who stunk up the car. Even on small things like lying, like, uh, I mean, not lying, like being late, right? You're late for a meeting. And what do you do? Instead of just saying, you know what, I'm lazy and I can't manage time, what do we do? (laughs) Traffic was really bad. This happened, that happened. I myself find myself trying to justify myself. You know what those are? Those are fig leaves. Fig leaves. Why not just say, you know, I'm running late. I just, I, I've got a chronic problem. We have a desperate need to be justified. And that's okay. You know what it means? It means we were, here's what it means. Why do we have this? Why do we, is it, why do we so much want to be better than we are? Why do we want to impress other people? How come we actually want to make everybody think we're better than, why? Why do we do that? Do you know why we do that? Because we were made in the image of God. Imago Dei. We have fallen from Imago Dei, and we are desperate to get back there again. We're just desperate to actually be good, to actually be nice. To actually be selfless and care about others. We're desperate for it. And so in our desperation, we try to justify ourselves. Here's what I want us to know. Jesus died on a cross for one reason and one reason only. Do you know what that reason was? To justify us. To justify us? Yeah. To make us just as if we never sinned. To justify us? Yeah. Justify means to be made right. Justify means to be made good. And Jesus died on a cross to justify us. Here's the question. Are you going to do it by your fig leaves? By the works of your hands? Or are you going to allow him to justify you? Something amazing happens when we really embrace this truth. More than just intellectual knowledge, okay? Oh yeah, I believe that. I believe believe Jesus died on the cross. Yeah, I believe that. What's for lunch? More than that, right? When it goes from intellectual knowledge to actually in our heart to who we are, here's what happens. We quit trying to justify ourselves as much. We're just more honest about our shortcomings and our failures. We're just not so demanding about it. It has to be my way. Hey, can't we talk? We're not so darn right. We're more humble. We're more teachable. We're more real. And life and life abundance comes when we allow Jesus to justify us. I have good news for you. If Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, you are justified. You do not need to justify yourselves any longer. You do not need to prove your worth. You do not need to earn your keep. You do not need to justify your faults. You just need to bring them to Jesus and watch him cleanse you. We're going to partake of communion in just a little bit. Do you know what that represents? It represents the work that Jesus did on the cross to justify you, to make you right with God, to make you right, period. And Adam and Eve, once clothed in the righteousness of God, are now naked and trying to cover their own shame. Let's close with these last verses. Verse 8. Are you still tracking with me? And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Here's what I know happening. If you start justifying yourself, if you start trying to be a good person, here's what I know. You will not be at church. 
you will not be in prayer, and you will start de- just trying to find a way to make yourself believe that God's not real. You'll start trying to embrace some crazy theories because you're trying to hide yourself from God. Why hide? Did you not sew a covering? Were the works of your hands not making you a nice covering? Why are you hiding from God? I want you to know this. Whatever theory you embrace in life, well, I think I'm a good person, and as long as I do more good than bad, in the end it'll work out fine. Okay, you've believed a lie. You've decided for yourself what is right and wrong. Sounds good. I mean, it sounds good to me. It makes sense. It makes total logic to me. As long as you do more good than bad, when you stand before God, everything's going to be fine. It makes sense, and your fig leaves will give you adequate clothing until you hear the voice of God, and you will go, oh, shoot, I'm in trouble. My covering is inadequate. I do not want him to see me. And you will stand before him with a faulty covering. Verse 9. The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Notice who is looking for who. Notice this. I want you to know God is a loving God. His mercy is incredible. His relentless love never tires. And he loves to restore sinners. God seeks out the lost to bring them salvation. That is what God is doing here. He is seeking them out and saying, hey, where are you? What happened to our relationship? I want you back. Have you ever had anybody wrong you after you've really blessed them? I've had people that I've really tried to bless. You know, maybe I gave them a bunch of money or a bunch of love and then they leave you and they say bad things about you, man, that hurts. God poured all his love on Adam and Eve. He created everything for them. He made them kings and queens of the earth and gave them dominion over it all. He said, that's all yours. Now just choose to walk with me. And they stepped on him. And God says, I still want you back. I still want you back. I marvel that God didn't say, all right, I can't believe you guys did this. You're done. No more breath for you. And with a snap, they could have returned back to the dust. And then I'll make Bill and Sue, and I'll see how they do. Been reading Dr. Zeus lately. God didn't do that. Do you know why God didn't do that? Because guess what Bill and Sue would have done? They would have fallen also. And so God then puts down Bill and Sue, and then he makes Sam and Tammy. And guess what Sam and Tammy would have done? Same thing. There's a passage in Isaiah 59. I love this passage. This is Isaiah 59, 16. God just being displeased that there was no justice on the earth. And here's what it says. He saw that there was no man And he wondered that there was no intercessor. Why is there not one man who will do the right thing? Why is there not one man who will will just honor me and walk in my ways? He wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for himself. And his own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a blessed breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head and on and on it goes of talking about what he's going to do to bring redemption why did God not not put down Adam and Eve and make Bill and Sue or Tammy Tammy Faye Baker no that's somebody else Uh, why because no matter who he made they would have fallen because there's none righteous no not one there's only one who is righteous his name is Jesus And he is the redeemer. He's the one we worship. He's the one we follow. Let's finish up this passage so we can take communion. The great redeemer coming to his people saying, come back to me. God called Adam, verse 9, says, where are you? I want you. I want to bring you back. 
I miss our fellowship. Verse 10, he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. His guilt was discovered. The moment that we step outside of what God says is right and wrong, we will have guilt discovered. You look back on your life and you go, oh man, wish I didn't do that. Wish I didn't sleep with them. Wish I didn't say that. Wish I didn't act this way. Wish I didn't. Guilt discovered. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Hid myself? Yeah, you might want to circle hid myself and write that the result of guilt. Guilt discovered? I was afraid. The result of guilt? I hid myself. Tried to make my own coverings. Verse 11. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? What is God looking for here? What is God looking for? When God asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know what's going on. When God ever asks you a question, it's for your sake, not his. What's he doing? Adam, I care for you. I'm coming to you. I want you back. Do you want me back? That's the question before you today. God wants you back. Do you want him back? And Adam, totally insensitive to the heart of God, look at his response. The man said, the woman you gave me, she gave me the tree and I ate. I wish it read this. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Will you please forgive me? Oh God, I need you. Verse 13, and so God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, well, it wasn't really my fault. It was the serpent. In an attempt to save his own skin, Adam puts all the blame on his wife. If I know anything about women at all, I bet that really helped his marriage. <laughs> Take ownership, men, of what's wrong in your family. And do not blame your wife for it. You are the spiritual head. Eve does about the same thing. And I tell you, all this reveals to us is how desperate we are to be justified. And unless a man is born again in Jesus Christ, he will wander through his whole life trying to justify himself. And boy, it looks ugly, doesn't it? Doesn't it look ugly? Do you want to be that man? There's only one way not to be that man. Let Jesus justify you. May we come to Jesus and find rest. May we quit trying to justify ourselves, tr quit trying to hide our sin, quit trying to put on our own righteousness, quit trying to blame others, quit comparing ourselves with others. May we just allow the righteousness of Jesus Christ to clothe us again. Amen?